God. We thank you for giving us the strength to say farewell to fear. Farewell to our insecurity. Farewell to all of that which was so grievously beset us. Oh God, we thank you that you have given us power. Power, oh God. And love and a sound mind so that we can stand against any of the darts that the enemy wants to hurl at us. We are no longer fearful because we are saved, sanctified, and filled with the Holy Ghost. So God, thank you for taking us this far along our path. Now, Lord, give us some more. Speak to us, oh God. Let your word speak to us. In Jesus' name we pray. And the people of God say, Amen. Amen. Uh, this morning, I want you to meet me in uh, the Gospel according to Luke, the fourth chapter of the Gospel according to Luke. And I want you to journey with me a little bit because I want to talk about perhaps the shortest and most powerful sermon that Jesus ever preached. Luke, the fourth chapter, beginning at the 14th verse. I'm going to take a look. Now he's going to read the scripture, but that's not the sermon that the church said, amen. amen. So I don't know y'all, I don't try to add time to my sermon, but I'm just trying to set the table for you when I'm reading the scripture, amen. I'm doing like Jesus. I'm going to read the, I'm going to read the scripture, but when you do this with Jesus, the sermon today, the sermon is very short, it's a sentence. One sentence, amen. I wish I could do that, amen, praise God. Amen. But not today, Amen. Luke, the fourth chapter, beginning at the 14th verse, reads this way. Jesus returned to Galilee and the powers of the Spirit. And news about him spread through the whole countryside. He was teaching in their synagogues and everyone praised him. He went up to Nazareth where he had been brought up. And on the Sabbath day, he went into the synagogue as was his custom. He stood up to read and the scroll of the prophet Isaiah was handed to him. Unrolling, and he found the place where it is written. Verse 18 The Spirit of the Lord is on me, because he has anointed me to proclaim good news to the poor. He has sent me to proclaim freedom for the prisoners and recovery of sight for the blind, to set the oppressed free, and to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor. Many of us have heard the old adage that familiarity breeds contempt. And as we see in our gospel text today, and we will see in our gospel text today how this happened to Jesus when he went back to his hometown of Nazareth. My brothers and sisters, familiarity breeds contempt. Hear me on this. Familiarity breeds contempt. Only with contemptible things or among contemptible people. Familiarity only breeds contempt with contemptible things or among contemptible people. The contempt showed by the Nazarene said nothing about Jesus Christ, but it said a great deal about them. Sometimes when you're showing contempt for somebody, it may not be about them as much as it is. And I am convinced that most people are not opposed to having people from their hometowns become successful or even famous. Yet we are so familiar with those we grow up with that we often fail to see the potential, the greatness in them. Amen. How often have we heard someone place a slur towards some successful person that they knew in their youth instead of rejoicing? Uh, you know, y'all still talking about how Pookie used to be back in the day. Now Pookie is the president of the company and you still trying to bring him back to where he used to be. Instead of rejoicing that, look at what the Lord has done. Uh, and sometimes I guess we are surprised and suspicious of their success. But if we are not careful, we could miss much of what is important in life if we have a limited vision. There was a, a vegetable 
a vegetable juice commercial where someone would drink a soda or some other juice and then realize that they had missed out on something better. And the commercial would end was like, wow, I could have had a VA. And now that's a catchy phrase, but when it is applied to life, it can be very sad sometimes. Because we must, we must have an open heart to the movement of God. Your heart has to be open to where God is trying to take you. We don't want to miss out on what the Lord has in store for each of us. We don't want to settle for less when we could have had Jesus. In our text, Jesus returns to Nazareth, where a year before he had been rejected by the people, he had been evicted from the synagogue. It was certainly an act of grace on his part to give the people another opportunity to hear this word. Another opportunity to believe another opportunity to be saved. Yet their hearts remain hard. That they could have had Jesus, but they chose unbelief. Mm -hmm. Now, if you were reading this concurrently with Mark, you would have seen how Jesus had performed, up until this point, Jesus had been performing great miracles throughout the region. He had healed a man possessed by a legion of demons. He had raised Jairus' daughter, 12 year old daughter, from the dead. And now in our gospel text, we see Jesus returning home to Nazareth. Our Lord had come away from the crowds in order to find rest. Our Lord's reputation had once received. Had once again preceded him, so he was permitted to teach in the synagogue. And the contrast between the peasant carpenter of Galilee who earned his baby bread by the sweat of his brow with the person who delivered the wonderful discourses and performed those miracles was too much. Mm. Come on, For the townspeople, yes, you ain't nothing. What, what are you doing standing up there? You, you're just a carpenter. Remember the words when they heard that Jesus came from Nazareth. Can anything good come from Nazareth? So there's some interesting people in this congregation that go online and say crazy Because they from places like Des Moines and Kansas City. They question sometimes whether anything good can come from Detroit. But I got good news for y'all. Oh, let's split them on your feet. Can anything good come out of Nazareth? I don't know why y'all won't mess with me and I'm going to preach the next day. <laughs> Nazareth, it was a town. Nazareth was a town was, uh, with less than a stellar reputation. They took offense. They were astonished. And their astonishment was so great that their composure was exhausted. The, the, the discourse and the miracles of our Lord struck them so forcibly that they were astonished to the point of losing control of themselves. And in this state of unbelief, they brought no one to Jesus. Therefore, no miracles could occur. They could have had Jesus, but they chose unbelief. What was in Jesus' teaching that generated so much heat, so much discourse with the people? Well, in Luke, we are told more about the controversy. Let, let, let's, let's go back over that scripture again. What Luke has to say. Jesus is reading from Isaiah. The Spirit of the Lord is upon me because he has anointed me to preach good news to the poor. He sent me to proclaim freedom for the prisoners and recovery of sight to the blind, to release the oppressed, to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor. But if you stay with the text, Jesus is a cool preacher. Because yeah. he rolls it up and he gives it back to the attendant. Yeah. And he said, yeah. Yeah. And, 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 and all of the eyes of the congregation were fixed on him. The congregation awaited his comment, his interpretation of those ancient words, a messianic promise for them. They wanted, would Jesus address the occupation, the oppression of the empire, or perhaps his own ministry, which is gaining attention throughout the region? And no one breathed. The community alert with expectation. 
What would Jesus, their neighbor, say? Jesus might have preached on the wisdom of the old prophet. He could have said in the past, our fathers and mothers envisioned the world of justice, freedom and healing, the fullness of abundant life in the land of milk and honey as God promised Moses. Or he might have elaborated on the world to come. We, along with Isaiah, await the fulfillment of the glorious promise. One day, the poor will be lifted up, the captain set free, the blind will see. Oh, how we long for that. How we pray for that. But it seems so slow and coming. Or Jesus could have appealed to his friend's sense of theological nostalgia. How great Isaiah was. Or their fragile theological hope for a better future. The kingdom of God will come. But he did not. Instead, Jesus looked at the congregation, looked them dead in the eye, and preached this sermon. Today, the scripture has been fulfilled in your hearing. The sermon. Today, the scripture has been fulfilled in your hearing. Oh, the folk was shocked. What do you mean the spirit of the Lord is here now? Today, that the poor hear good news, that the prisoners are released, that the blind see, that the oppressed receive justice. This is the year of the Lord's favor. Hey, Jesus, have you been watching the news? Jesus, are you aware of how horrible things are? There is more inequality than ever, more people in prison unjustly, more illness of all sorts, more violence and terrorism than our ancestors ever knew. This now today is the kingdom of God. Jesus, are you crazy? Uh, today, the scripture has been fulfilled in your hearing. Not yesterday, not tomorrow, today. And with that word, Jesus' furious neighbors tried to throw him off a cliff. Faith communities are often consumed with memories of the past and hope for the future. Because, see, speaking of the past, I, I said something, y'all, I did it on the way. Let me say it again, but I might have said it too fast. Faith communities, churches, churches are often consumed with memories of the past and hopes for the future. Because speaking of the past may take the form of maintaining buildings and structures of teaching ancient texts and passing on patterns of lies and values from our ancestors. Speaking of the future is often wrapped up in hopes for salvation and, and eternal life. Uh, that desire is for answered prayers for children to hold on to the faith for children to come back to the church. Yeah. Yeah. Both the past and the present and the, and the future are important to vibrant communities. Healthy and life-giving practices of honoring our ancestors and embracing a hopeful, hopeful future derived from the witness of a whole biblical tradition. But my brothers and sisters, there are also some problems with that. Yes, because overemphasizing the past results in nostalgia. The belief that the past is better than either the present or the future. A disposition yes. that is steeped in grief and fear. Yes. But it's already been as good as it's ever going to be. That's scary to me. Sometimes, you know, those of us who've been around more than a few decades, amen, you know, we start thinking our best days are behind us. Uh, you know, back in the day, ooh, yeah, we was bad. But now we on the downside. Uh, Y'all don't know what I'm talking about. Oh, back in the day, I, I church was this, that, and the other. But now, And overemphasizing over the future, the belief that all that matters is that which is to come, often results in what is both doubt and anxiety. Because sometimes we want the future to be bright, but sometimes we look at the future, and I don't know about them. That's my feeling. We get caught up because sometimes the future does not coalesce, uh, correspond, uh, relate with our past. So we get scared, okay? But 
today. But today is a deeply dangerous spiritual reality because today insists that we lay aside our memories and our dreams to embrace fully the moment of now. The past romanticizes the work of our ancestors, the future scares the horizons of our descendants and depends upon them to fix everything. But today places us in the midst of the sacred drama, reminding us that we are the actors and agents of God in God's design for the world. Today is the most radical thing that Jesus ever said. Jesus essentially said to the congregation, look around. See the Spirit of God at work right here, right now. God is with us. Just as I am reminded of the of Moses and the burning bush, I will be with you. This is a sign of God's covenant. The ever active, ever loving, ever liberated, always present God is here with us. In the faith, Jesus is asking the church to open their eyes the seed of burning bush to become more attentive to God's promise to abide with Israel in the land. That God is keeping God's promise no matter how awful the outward circumstances. This is not a call to be cool, meditate, and everything else will go away. Instead, it is a call to see more deeply past the immediate sin, injustice, trials, and evils of human life to the profound of love and compassion upon which everything else truly rests. The love of God and the love of David. In other words, my brothers and sisters, today is the day for you to give God the praise. Today is the day for you to say, I want to live for God. Today is the day that God has called you to be better than you've ever been before. Because if we can't see good in us, uh -oh, we are in trouble. 
because if God puts somebody out of us and we say, oh no, it can't be one of us, then that's a problem. That means that we don't see any good in us. Oh, don't get one of those. You better check the text this morning because it might be talking about you. It might be talking about you. It might be talking about me. We better understand and look around that God is saying to about the resurrection and all of that kind of stuff. In their eyes, Jesus wasn't special. Yeah. Jesus didn't have no degree. Jesus didn't go to seminary. Jesus didn't have no degree. Jesus didn't have no Jaguar parked out in the parking lot. <laughs> Jesus had, Jesus walked everywhere. Jesus didn't have no big house in West Des Moines. He didn't live south of Grand. As a matter of fact, he didn't even live in the homeless show. Wait a minute, bring this and say. Come on now. There is a danger, my brothers and sisters, in our Christian lives that we too can miss out on God's blessings. Yeah. We can miss out if we fail to recognize God's message or God's messenger. The people in Nazareth missed out as the scripture sadly reports. Jesus could do no deed of power in Nazareth until the lay his hands on a few sick people and cure them. And Jesus was amazed that there unbelief. He could do no deed of power there, not even one. So why could Jesus do no deed of power in Nazareth? Because the people of Nazareth were so consistently unbelieving that they would not even bring their sick to him to be healed. Even though he had been doing it elsewhere, all over the place, they said, no, I need Jesus. He's from here. He can't do nothing. He could do no deed of power because no one came forth to receive the power from on high. The people of Nazareth accepted what the world had to offer when they could have had Jesus. Yesterday was Moses and Elijah, and they were waiting on tomorrow when Jesus said, Today, today the scripture is fulfilled in your hearing. But they rejected him. They rejected God's gift of the good news. They rejected God's gift of freedom from bondage. They rejected God's gift of a new vision. They rejected God's gift of release. They rejected God's gift of favor. So where is the church today? Where are you today? Where are we today? Do we believe that Jesus is active today? Oh, we talk, we talk a lot about uh, Donald Trump. And somebody will say, Nancy Pelosi is your savior. Y'all in trouble for real. Jesus is coming today. Jesus is here today. You better tend your hope and your faith and your trust on Jesus. But I need to know, do you come believing today? Do you come today with a heart open to God? Do you come today expecting Jesus to be with you right now? Jesus is free. His promise to each of us is crystal clear. I promise never of your life.
the Bible says I can do what? All day. Now, through Christ, uh, who strengthens me right now. <laughs> Beloved, we can do all day. Through Christ, who strengthens us. But the time is not yesterday, and you don't have to wait for tomorrow. Because, brothers and sisters, boys and girls, friends and foes, uh, Today is the day. The of the church are on. Give God praise if you know that He's here right now, today. If you know that God's Spirit is in you right now, today, you ought to shout, Hallelujah. If you know that God is able to work it out for you right now, today, go ahead and throw up your hands and say, Thank you. the wrong idea. I don't want you to get the wrong idea. I'm not talking down on what happened yesterday, and I'm certainly not talking about down what's going to happen tomorrow. But sometimes, my brothers and sisters, inactivity voids tomorrow. Amen? The tomorrow you want begins with today. And so, I don't care. I don't care no more. Don't tell me about all your aches and pains. Because the Lord woke you up this morning and started you on your way. And if the Lord woke you up this morning, that means he has work for you to do. And so today is your day. Uh, I know, I know back in the day, I was this bad at the other, but you're still here. So that means God has some work for you to do today. Today you can remind us that God is able, that God can take you to the next level. Stop taking us back into the into the past, but help us see what's going on today. Today, quit talking about my kids. Quit talking about the children that live in this town. But you know, y'all, we let the news media say, "Well, you know, these kids they 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 slow. They they falling behind. These are our kids, and if we don't do something today, there won't be a tomorrow. So we got to we got to rest the idea that today." Wrong. And if we put God in, in, in God into action, some people say, well, oh, he took the prayer out of school, but he didn't take prayer out of your house. Yeah. So you pray your kids up before they go, and God will be with them. Yeah. And God will be with them. We got to do this today. And so today is your day. If you have not given your life to Christ, if you are looking for a church home, Today is your day. Don't wait till they say, but I want to wait to hear what the choir sound like. Uh, don't worry about the choir. You ain't in it. <laughs> don't worry about what well, I want to see the, the marches of your voice. I can tell you that right now, they ain't got one. <laughs> so that's your problem, and that ain't never going to happen. But today, God is still working things out in your heart. And that's why you need to give your life over to God today. I don't, you may have some big plans that are growing up in you right now, but you better start today to put them into action. Because if you put it off till tomorrow, or you know that thing, because we're still looking for it, right? I'm still looking for a round to it, okay? But I'm waiting for somebody to give me a round to it. Because everybody said, well, I'll do it when I get a round to it. That means you're putting it off. So, your round, here's your round to it. Here is your round to it. Here is your round to it. Today is your day. Won't you come? Give your hand to the preacher. Give your life to the Lord. We want you. Come.
Yeah. 